so my name is Chris Monson. Uh, I am the director of the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. Also, I'm with the, the U.S. Forest Service, and you'll hear uh, from me at Maria Genoviac uh, uh, with our licensing organizations. So I'm going to uh, step you through um, some basic science about climate change and uh, some particular impacts that are forecast or have already happened uh, here in this in this region. Uh, I have a, a, a fair amount of ground to cover, so I'm going to go at a, at a pretty decent clip. And I'm going to just go ahead and apologize beforehand uh, for the amount of information I'm going to throw at you. Uh, rest assured, we have some time afterwards for questions, and, uh, and we also uh, have the whole rest of the day. And then uh, you've just got years. You'll have our email address. You can always get a little less than that. So, uh, you know, don't feel like as the information is coming at you, you have to remember it. You have to know it right this second. There's lots of time to come back. So, and I just also want to say that uh, it's a particular honor to be here at this year's inaugural meeting because this is a really amazing uh, thing that you all are doing. And you, in, in particular, are, are an impressive group. Uh, I applaud your, your dedication and commitment. All right, so who, who are we? Anyway, that's just the first step, so I do get that question a lot. So the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, uh, NIACS, I'll use that word because that's just a real mouthful, uh, so I'll just say NIACS. Uh, we're multi-institution, uh, and uh, so even within the Forest Service, of course, there are multiple branches. Uh, one is all about research. I'm uh, actually a member of that branch, as is Maria. Uh, another is all about uh, management. Uh, and then the third is state and private, and, and they primarily uh, provide uh, assistance and funding for projects uh, such as H2H and also state forestry agencies uh, and other things. Uh, and then, so these three organizations provide us with most of our funding. Um, and, uh, and if it were just them, we would be a Forest Service Institute. Uh, well, um, we also have non-Forest Service partners. Michigan Tech University is one. And uh, our, uh, our primary office is housed actually on the campus of that university. Uh, and then the National Council for Air and Student Improvement, uh, they're actually an industry-funded uh, science organization, uh, and they provide us uh, both with funding and uh, they challenge us consistently on, on things that we put out. Uh, and then uh, the Trust for Public Land, uh, which, uh, which many of you uh, know about, it's one of the large uh, trust organizations in the United States. Uh, so these organizations actually are uh, fairly different uh, in their makeup and their, um, and their major aims, their sort of sub-missions within the Forest Service or overall missions uh, within the public sphere. What they all hold in common, though, is uh, the sense that there is the need for an organization that um, bridges the gap between broad academic discussion of climate change and the needs of land managers uh, and in general public who are making decisions uh, on the ground trying to cope with that uh, uh, very complex information about climate change. So our institute was created to do this. That's why I do this. Uh, so we focus on climate and then primarily on climate adaptation. Uh, we do carbon, uh, which is the thing that I love doing. It's kind of my, my gateway in climate, honestly. Uh, and then we, we do some biology. Uh, so this is uh, the, the footprint that we work in generally. And, uh, and we, we have a, a program uh, that we coordinate called the Climate Change Response Framework. Um, this program uh, is really a community program, and it, and it exists uh, through the, the, uh, the contributions of the community into it. Uh, and so it, there are more than 100 organizations uh, that in some way contribute or work with it. Um, and uh, but we work with National Forest, of course, um, uh, because of our, our primary funding source. But we were told when we were created as an institute that if we only worked with the National Forest, uh, we would be considered failures. Uh, we were told outright that uh, um, our mandate is to work with everybody and anybody who wants to think about uh, the issues of climate change and how, it, uh, and how to integrate those issues into their land management and their land uh, decisions. And so that's what we do, and that's what this program uh, is, is really about. Uh, so the Climate Change Response Framework, it, it, it works in different ways at different scales with different organizations, because as you'll even know in this group, there are different organizations that themselves work at different scales. 
scales and have different interests at those scales. Uh, and so, but critical is that partnership aspect. And I'll say again, uh, as an institute, we have about seven people who do full-time adaptation uh, all the time. And that makes us one of the biggest adaptation-focused organizations on, uh, in the Eastern United States. Uh, and yet, that's seven people. Right, that's still pretty tiny, and so uh, and so it's really all about. Uh, I think what Bill was just saying earlier, uh, expanding capacity through cooperation, and um, uh, a capacity multiplier is an effective uh, is an effective partnership in which uh, multiple organizations are able to contribute time and energy and expertise, uh, which other organizations uh, can't, and then together you can create something that uh, no single organization. Climate change is that perfect sort of issue where you really need that sort of cooperation. I, I say perfect in, in a kind of bad way. Uh, so then uh, we do a lot of vulnerability assessment because if you're going to think about adaptation, you should have a sense of what is vulnerable and what you might need to adapt. Uh, either foster adaptation uh, in a system or adapt uh, your own organization's approach toward a system. And, uh, and, and you'll hear a lot more about that from Maria today. We'll all have a chance to talk about it. Um, we provide forced adaptation resources. Um, you know, really kind of the talks we're giving today in some way are, are like that, but we also have workbooks and, uh, and tools and we bring together strategies and so on and that sort of uh, uh, broader uh, sense of resources. And we uh, provide those to many different organizations. And then really, what it all comes down to is getting something done on the ground. Um, and people learn by example. And so uh, what we, we feel, people learn best by example. And so what we try to do is bring all the rest of this stuff down into something that actually happens and gets done. And then we try to tell that story. And we try to tell as many stories as we can about all the different kinds of organizations that are thinking about this issue that might not even agree with each other on basic land use, but that are still struggling with how to sustainably manage uh, forest or wildlife or water or, or some other resource. You know, and our, honestly and genuinely grab, uh, grappling with how to do this well. Um, so we try to tell all those stories so that we can all learn from each other and learn faster. So applied climate science, uh, you, uh, there's lots of information out there. You all will have run across some of it, uh, at least. Um, some of you might have tried to dig into it a bit, uh, maybe a lot, and just found that no matter how deep you dig, there's still more. And the deeper you dig, in fact, more likely it is to sort of come down on top of you. Uh, we get that. In fact, we do uh, get that there is this fire hose of information that sometimes we <laughs> feel like we're all forced to drink from. Uh, and so that's, again, one of the reasons we exist. And there's this sense of, okay, there's this fire hose of, of this information, much of it very complex, much of it created by people who are well-meaning but are very academic and don't get um, where the rest of us are. And so how do you translate this information into uh, the, the, the values that people who are working on the ground and are not scientists hope and, and, and want to apply. Um, and that's not easy. And we, uh, that's what we do, and we're constantly learning. And we're learning from uh, discussing uh, needs with folks like yourselves. Um, another critical aspect of this is how do you feed information back? Once you learn about these people and their values, what they need, what they perceive, how do you feed it back? That's another role that we play in the is we're really designed. Okay, now I'm going to move on to some of this climate change information. And, uh, and I'm going to do it in a, in a format of frequently asked questions because we get a lot of questions. And, um, and I'll tell you right now that these are good questions. Uh, I won't give you a single question that I don't feel is a good question. None of these are strong men, uh, which I've been accused of. But none of these are strong. I, I think they're good. And I come back to this information again and again as it needs to be refreshed as people learn new things, and sometimes the questions themselves change. Uh, Maria, who is, who is our logisticizer and has, the, uh, has the, 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 the schedule all worked out, has, has only um, kept me to three questions, and I, but I have talks with uh, 12 or 15. So I can keep going, but I'm not, you guys are safe from me. But you can uh, come back uh, later again and ask your question, um, and because uh, I very much like to hear it, Chances are I can talk at length about it. Well, maybe it makes sense, but I can certainly talk. So here's one that I get all the time. Uh, scientists disagree. Uh, so who are we supposed to uh, believe? And, um, and so one way that I come uh, at this is to say, well, yeah, right. 
scientists actually really do agree on climate change, uh, and they say that um, that it is unequivocal that it is happening. It really is happening. There is no doubt. Uh, I had never seen this word before in a scientific document uh, before it came out in that fourth IPCC report, um, and it came out in the fifth one too. Further, that it's extremely likely that we are contributors. This won't always be a part of conversations you have with people. But ultimately, it is an important part because it fundamentally lends uh, an amount of, um, of uncertainty to what we're going to see in the future. And I'll get into that in a minute. But what it means is there is built-in uncertainty. And that, uh, that, that changes our perspectives on things, or will change our perspectives on things as we get used to this idea. Um, and then another is 18 national academies all over the world, including uh, our national academy and the one up in Canada, have agreed uh, on these basic principles and on this basic idea of climate change. So pretty good, uh, pretty good agreement, actually. Um, but there's another way to go at this. So in terms of disagreement, uh, let's take a hypothetical. So I'm, I'm a guy, and I'm in charge of a bridge. And, uh, and I have my structural engineer come to me and say, you know, uh, this bridge, I'm, I'm seeing some trouble with this bridge. I don't think it's going to be structurally sound. I give you 50 years. I give you 75 years. I'm not sure. But this bridge, uh, it's, it's, it's not looking so good. It's probably your fault. But let's not talk about that. <laughs> and um, anyway, you didn't know before, but I'm telling you now. Uh, and I say, you know what? You're fired. I don't want to deal with this. And so I go, I get another structural engineer and ask her, you know, what do you think about the bridge? And she tells me, yeah, I'm not so sure about this bridge. I think it's probably not looking good. You got some time, but you got to start dealing with this. And I say, you're fired. And so uh, I, I do this a few times, uh, say 97, and, um, and I get I keep getting all these, these, these folks, and they're telling me the same thing. I get a couple, they say, you know, I don't know, bridge might be all right. Yeah, probably not, but it might be all right. And I get one who says, no worries. You're fine. Good. Don't worry about it. And fall, forget about the fall. You're good. Now, of course, I don't like that stuff. I'm going to believe this person outright. This is the person I believe right here. But is my bridge, I know somebody's going to blame me if something goes wrong. And so basic risk management, doesn't matter who I believe. I think all these people are a bunch of poops, but there's a lot of them. And basic risk management is when 97 structural engineers tell me I got a problem, I'm going to start coping with that problem. And, and so, um, of course, you know where I'm going, right? Climate change, uh, 97 out of 100 climate experts, these are climate scientists, say that we're causing it, that it is a problem and we're causing it. So, um, so that's just something to deal with. And you don't have to believe, you just have to think about risk. And uh, when you get this much agreement out there amongst these many experts on a particular subject, uh, that is a distinct risk that we're dealing with. And so when you come back to this idea of risk, then um, really a practical risk assessment may be better uh, than belief itself. And so just look at the information out there. But even if you're unsure of the information out there, look at how the experts agree. So that's the bottom line about the, the agreement on, on climate change. So, but we hear about our, well maybe, but it's changed before, right? So uh, we don't need to worry so much about it now. And I'm not going to get too much into this. Milankovitch cycles. So in the past, that whole climate variability bit, um, it's really caused by the way the Earth uh, rotates around the sun and eccentricities and uh, the tilt uh, of, of the axis um, that changes through time and little wobbles in the axis. That has driven uh, climate change through the past. And so if you look at over, um, the last 450,000 years, and you look at um, in blue temperatures and in red uh, carbon dioxide, what you'll generally see is that, and in fact, this was hypothesized before these data were ever um, uh, measured. Uh, what you'll generally see is that uh, because of these wobbles in the Earth, they will drive temperature, and then the carbon cycle will adapt to that changing temperature. And so then carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere um, changes at, uh, at about 800 to 1,000 years later after that after that change in temperature, uh, and then it just sort of exacerbates whatever the direction is, whether it's warming or cooling. It makes it either cooler or, or warmer faster. Uh, that's been the way it's been uh, for all of human existence, and um, and then and then we have now, 
And what's happening now is we've kind of flipped that on its head because we've put out so much carbon so fast that instead of, uh, instead of the, the way the Earth rotating around the sun affecting climate, we're driving climate with the carbon. And instead of the, the temperature driving carbon, we're driving temperature with carbon. So, uh, so that's that sort of variability that we're looking at. And, and I'll you know, remind you, I mean, this is all of human history. It's right in here. Uh, so we've been in a fairly narrow range. And so when people say, uh, yeah, you know, there's been lots of variability. Well, well there has been, but uh, we haven't really seen most of it. And to the degree we have seen some of it, you know, we were still wearing furs and living in caves. So we're a lot more complex as a society now. And, um, and we really uh, depend on things uh, working the way we're used to them working. Now, uh, we've seen uh, change over the last 150 years, 120 years, and that change has been increasing. So that's something uh, that we've been measuring, and that has something that is continuing. So the bottom line is, you know, if it's always changed, why do we worry? Well, it's happening fast now. Um, and then also, um, everything uh, that we depend on in our economies, and our lives, and our values, uh, is really inter interwoven. And so uh, the degree of that change is happening fast, um, it's going to affect all those things. And we're going to have to cope with that in one way or another. Okay, here's another one. Um, and this, I totally get. The answer is huge. The world is huge. You know, how can, how can we really affect that? And I've gotten this question numerous times directly. And, uh, and so, um, so this is a, a, a schematic of, of, of net uh, of fluxes into and out of the atmosphere. And so you have this, you know, geological reservoirs, right, coal and oil. And, and then in red, you have numbers for the decade from 2000 to 2009. So in that decade, um, about seven and a half gigatons, which is a billion tons of carbon, was emitted in the atmosphere each year during that decade. And um, at the same time, during that decade, just over a ton, a, a billion tons, a gigaton of carbon was emitted from land use change. That's conversion from, say, generally forest uh, into something different, a uh, non-forest, uh, sometimes, a lot of time, grassland. Uh, and then uh, what you've got, though, offsetting that are sinks. Those are both uh, 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 sources. They have a sink. One is uh, into um, uh, forest and grassland, and about two and a half gigatons is sucked back into ecosystems. And another two and a half gigatons is sucked into the ocean. And so you have some offset there, which is wonderful. Um, but ultimately, we're putting more in, or sorry, we put more out than we're taking. So you got about four gigatons a year going into the atmosphere um, that wasn't there before. And um, if you think about how much carbon there is out there, uh, most of it's in the ocean. Um, and you think about what's in soils and vegetation, you got about 2,300 gigatons, lots of permafrost. Uh, now, what we've put out over um, the last 150 years or so of since the Industrial Revolution is about 347 gigatons. Now, like I showed you, not all that stayed in the atmosphere. A lot of it went into here and a lot of it went into here. But if you look at the atmosphere, it's only got 760 gigatons, and it didn't have that much when we first started all this. Um, so we've actually added quite a bit to it. There's the annual emissions. And so if the, the big question is, how do you... How do you affect something so huge as the atmosphere? Well, you put lots of carbon into it. It's huge. We're putting huge amounts of carbon into it. Another critical idea is that all of these things, they work in a cycle, the carbon cycle, the global carbon cycle. But essentially, since human existence, they've had their balance. It goes in and out. You saw that graph with the climate. Uh, climate changes, there's a little more, a little less there. Now, uh, with these industrial emissions, um, that carbon has been locked away from all the rest of this for millions of years. It effectively has not been a part of the global carbon cycle. So we're adding it. That's a net addition to the carbon cycle. That's how we're warming things. That's why things are changing. That's why they're changing fast. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm getting glared at by Maria back there. So we can move a little faster. These are my favorite slides. And so you know, I like to spend time on it. It's the carbon cycle. But, you know, so, you know, more has been happening faster recently. 
Um, that's what that slide says. But I can say it in a lot more words. Than you. Okay. So uh, uh, it's all clear in the in the measurement record uh, that this has been happening. Um, bottom line: How do you change something massive like the atmosphere? You put massive amounts of carbon into it. That's what we've been doing. We're very impressive, I think, as a species. Um, so now, how has climate changed over the past century? Um, well, uh, one, it's gotten warmer, and, and now we're looking at Connecticut. Now I'm getting more relevant to, to I, I, knew, I knew I had to get at least a little more relevant to what we're talking about. So um, it's gotten uh, warmer by about two and a half degrees here, which is about uh, how much it's, it's gotten warmer in a lot of places, but uh, more than some for certain. And um, winter has warmed the most, but there's also uh, been more extremely hot days. and. Uh, uh, you've seen a longer growing season, and that is reflected in, uh, in the phenology of plants. So they're f actually flowering earlier now uh, than they used to, because uh, winter ends uh, now earlier than they used to. So right here uh, in Connecticut, uh, you're already seeing changes uh, relative to 100 years, uh, certainly in temperature. Um, in precipitation, there's a lot more variability. Uh, some of you uh, might remember this graph in the mid-60s. Um, but, uh, but overall, uh, there has been an increase in precipitation. This is also true of many places. But uh, one critical thing to think about is that uh, precipitation isn't distributed equally throughout the year. So it's not like you get a little bit of an increase uh, every month. Um, there's been even a decrease, perhaps, in spring. Uh, and, uh, but one thing to think about uh, critically is that uh, the extreme rain events have uh, increased. Um, in the Northeast, they've probably increased um, more than anywhere else uh, in the country. And so what this means is that while this region is getting more rain overall, more of the rain it gets comes in big events, one inch, two inch, three inch, more than three inches in 24 hours. And, uh, and it's very hard for ecosystems to, uh, to use that rain, a lot of it just goes poof right out into the streams and takes soil, plants, um, roads with it. Uh, so another aspect is sea level rise uh, to worry about. And uh, we've seen about a foot uh, in the last 100 years of sea level rise. Uh, some places uh, a little more than that uh, south of here. And, um, and that's something that will uh, continue as well. Um, yeah, okay, I've got I to school myself to not get into too many details because I have lots of slides. So how is the climate expected to change um, going forward? So we just saw what we've measured, actually, in the past. What are we looking at in projected uh, futures? And um, one thing to start with is uh, this concept of uncertainty. And I alluded before to how humans are such an integral part of um, the climate now. And one of the reasons why there's uncertainty is because of that net addition that I talked about, the emissions. Um, we don't know what our emissions will be in 25, 50, 75 years. And so depending on what they are, that will affect uh, the, the warming and uh, the climate itself. And so um, you know, there are different scenarios, which are storylines, which assume certain uh, socioeconomic uh, and environmental conditions. And uh, depending on which storyline you choose, there is more or less, uh, there are more or less emissions. And depending on those emissions, you get uh, of, uh, different amounts of warming. So that is built in uncertainty uh, that we can't really ever get away from uh, in, in this uh, projection of climate futures. So, uh, if we look at anticipated climate change um, across that range of plausible futures, uh, we're looking at three to nine uh, increase uh, in degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the precipitation, there's really high variability again, perhaps uh, as much as a 15% increase overall, uh, but most of that is in winter and spring, uh, with a potential for decrease in summer. Um, one thing to come back to, with uh, that potential for decrease is that um, even if uh, a, a big global model shows, uh, and, they, and they work in big spaces, big time steps, uh, shows about the same rain and lots of variability. Um, lots of models showing lots of variability about the rain in a, uh, in a season. If, you're, if we're already seeing more extreme events, those are like, likely to continue. Uh, to the extent that you have more extreme events and more of the rain you're getting is in those events, 
one of the things we've been seeing is longer dry periods between those events. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you're a plant, you're not thinking necessarily annually. If you're uh, a fish, you're not thinking necessarily annually or seasonally. Um, it's you're experiencing that, uh, that, that uh, lack of moisture between big events, and then you're experiencing the big event. Uh, and so it's not about averages, it's about um, sometimes those pinpoint events um, and, and then uh, uh, the, the dryness between them. Uh, oh yeah, uh, certainly sea level rise, um, you can see greater areas in inundation. This is in, uh, uh, can you somebody pronounce that for me? Hammonasset, uh, State Fire Camp, not a local, just saying. Uh, I just want to get some audience participation. <laughs> Uh, so you see uh, greater inundation. Even before you see inundation, uh, a lot of the time you're going to see uh, this is salt water um, uh, kind of coming up in the water table and affecting the plants. Uh, so how can ecosystems be affected? Um, one is uh, uh, less snowfall um, and cover and depth. Uh, again, across that range of plausible climates, uh, 30 to 70, uh, with most of the decrease in uh, uh, December and January. And um, uh, you know, so that has any number of, uh, of impacts um, when you have less snow on, uh, on frozen soil, freeze thaw in soils, uh, uh, trees that are shallow rooted uh, in those soils and affected by that lack of insulation uh, from some trees, for example, uh, and, uh, and then the many animals uh, that, uh, that, that are affected by this. Um, water, so less snow, but lots more rain. Uh, again, uh, that's projected to increase, but given um, these, these episodic events, uh, you can get big uh, um, peak flows, um, followed by longer um, periods where you have lower flows, especially in the, in the growing season, and especially in the late growing season. Uh, so, um, you know, just think about, uh, if you're thinking about fish in this stream, if you're thinking about uh, the plants that grow alongside, you know, the effects that those might have. Um, and, uh, and, and this is about really a couple slides to describe that effect. Uh, you got, when you have average precipitation uh, and that increases, you have more runoff, less groundwater recharge. When it's hotter during that same time, you have more evaporation from the soil, uh, more transpiration from the plants. And, uh, and so really what happens is uh, you get uh, essentially more water lost from the system, less of that water that, that goes through the system is able to be used by the, the living parts of that system uh, that we value. Uh, so uh, a long growing season, this can be a great thing, uh, I think, uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, you know, a lot of people like to be out in the forest. Uh, there's potential for uh, lots of plants and animals to take advantage, uh, beneficial uh, insects, beneficial insects, uh, the ones that we value, uh, butterflies uh, can take advantage uh, potentially of the longer growing season. This isn't all bad stuff that we're dealing with here, so this is potentially a, a good thing. Uh, there are some bad things, potentially bad things, like uh, it gets warmer earlier, the plants respond, they put out buds, but it's still not quite uh, spring yet, and then you get the freeze again, and bam, you, you, you kill those buds. Um, same thing with uh, a lot of the uh, uh, roots that they might be putting out during that time. Or uh, water melts in a low area and then freezes again, and that's when it damages roots. Um, so frost damage during spring uh, can, can really have an effect uh, on, a wide, on widespread areas. Uh, now, changes in suitable habitat. Uh, this is another one. This is one of those long-term, gentle things that, that may be happening that we need to think about. And so there are lots of things that define a habitat uh, for a given species. But uh, really, there's a couple that we're looking at that are going to um, change with, with, uh, distinct, just time, with any kind of distinct um, uh, 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 certainty. And, uh, and so we use the, one of the tools we use is the Climate Change Tree Atlas. And they look at 134 trees and 147 birds. This is a niche model. It's, it, what it does is it looks at where plants are now and it looks at the, uh, the environmental uh, factors um, that surround those plants and it finds relationships. And then when you look at future uh, plausible climates, you see how some of those uh, uh, factors may change and then you um, use that to determine how uh, the, the, uh, the suitable habitat itself may change. And so if we look at uh, some of these changes, say for red spruce, um, and you got where it is now. 
Um, and, uh, and so um, with a uh, less change, and this is a, a model, and that's one of those scenarios I talked about, this is another model um, that tends to be a little bit more dire in its predictions because it's more sensitive uh, to, to, to greenhouse gases. Um, and this is one of the, uh, the higher emission scenarios. So you see more change with this combination of model and scenario. Um, you see basically red spruce lots here with the green, a little less here uh, with this sort of best case scenario future, um, and a lot less uh, with the I would call it worst case scenario, but more change uh, scenario future. So again, one of the ways that we work with this built-in uncertainty of a range of plausible futures is we always look at both. And then we try to think about the system we care about across that whole range. And we think, well, uh, is uh, to the extent that this system is probably vulnerable across the whole range, uh, we are carrying more risk at that point. <coughs> Uh, to the extent that it, we think it could be resilient um, and healthy across more of that range, we have less risk and potentially have more choices uh, if we want to keep the system as it is. Uh, you have another one, black oak. Uh, now, black oak is sort of that opposite. It can probably benefit uh, from climate change. Uh, and so we actually see, versus now, we actually see an increase um, from less change to more change. We actually see an increase in its suitable habitat. Now, when you look at these, and we have, you know, I'm not going to go through 134 of these, I promise. Uh, but when you look at them in, in general, one thing to think about is these are range shifts, uh, projected range shifts. They don't mean that the species themselves will move because uh, that's just not the way the species work. There's lots of things that slow them down, uh, people and, um, and uh, development being uh, critical things. Uh, and it just takes time. Climate is moving faster. Uh, generally than most of these plant species can move. So we don't know that they're going to uh, move. Likewise, the positive aspect of that is that when um, we show a decline, a potential decline in the species we love in a place, it doesn't mean it's all going to die off. It just means that its ideal habitat is kind of moving away from where those plants are now. And so maybe they're going to be a little more susceptible to stress. Maybe they're not going to be as vigorous. It doesn't mean they'll all die. And there can be pockets and this is that, that wonderful English muffin uh, example that, that we just heard from Bill, which I'm going to use again and again. Uh, where, you know, if you're up on, uh, I'm going to have to learn the words actually for the, the little divots and whatnot you're having in English. If you're up on a divot part in an English muffin, you know, maybe that's not so good for you anymore, so you go down into the nook. Cranny? You get my point, right? So uh, it's called escape on the landscape. These plants uh, can still exist in parts of the landscape, cold pockets, warmer pockets, wetter pockets, uh, even though overall on a broad landscape range, the, the, their suitable habitat is moved on. Uh, so invasive plants, this one is a biggie because uh, it seems, you know, what are invasive, why are invasive plants invasive? They love disturbance. Um, they're generally rural stage, early seral stage species. Um, and any time somebody tests one of these plants in a, in a growth chamber with lots of CO2, they just go crazy. For whatever reason, invasive plants love uh, probably climate change. So this is going to become something that is, uh, I think, as, as it already seems like it's a big problem, it will become, I think, more of a, of a crucial uh, and pressing uh, issue for us to think about. Um, heavy precipitation and disturbance, I already covered some of this. Um, one thing to think about is that, again, the models, they deal with big time steps, they deal with uh, uh, changes through times, they don't do the events well, um, but we are experiencing and seeing these events now, and there is uh, every likelihood that they will continue and get stronger, and uh, change the dynamics of the systems that we care about, both the way our, our streams and rivers work, the way our fish uh, live in those uh, streams, um, uh, the way our infrastructure uh, exists uh, with the streams, the way our, our forests um, um, and, and woodlands and, uh, and prairies all exist with each other and with uh, the water that's going through. Uh, insects and pests. Um, I, I mentioned you know, the, the, some of the insects we love, like butterflies, some of which may do, in fact, better with climate change. Um, and uh, the, the flip side is also true. Some of the insects we really, insects we really don't like uh, may do uh, better with climate change. Uh, these will certainly be the stories you hear more often um, uh, because they cause outright damage. 
And uh, the penlike woolly belgid is one where, again, in this lower emission scenario, uh, uh, and then the upper emission scenario, you see that the potential for it to, to expand. Um, of course, you've already, uh, you've already got it. So, um, uh, uh, we also see them going upward uh, in elevation, um, and so they're able to move across perhaps mountain ranges that they weren't able to move uh, before. Uh, so this is something we already deal with pests. Uh, this isn't a brand new uh, thing, um, but it's something that we'll have to think about a little differently as we think about pests that can move in and talk to people who are dealing with those same pests in other places and learn from them about what they're doing. So, uh, lots of impacts, and, uh, and the question and some of what we'll deal with uh, today is where do we go from here? This is a little bit of a gloom and doom talk. Uh, I get that. Um, we try to just do it in the morning, get it out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but the rest of the day is to talk about how to deal with it because uh, we are not powerless. Uh, we are not ignorant. Uh, this group uh, that is here is a great example of people coming together to deal with complexity, uh, to deal with issues. And, uh, and to work together while doing that. Um, so vulnerability, um, all of the, what I've talked about, uh, even as I tried to get it focused um, for your place, it's still, I mean, you saw the maps I was showing, it's still big regional trends. Uh, one issue is that, um, and that we love this, these focal areas, think about the place you work. Think about the history of these focal areas that you're working in. Think about the people who live there, Think about what they care about and how they're um, caring for their land. Um, and, uh, and think about that land itself. Uh, why is it better than average uh, in terms of uh, biodiversity or the ability to host biodiversity? Um, and, uh, and how might that continue? And how might uh, we help it continue as we interact with it? Um, what is more vulnerable that might need uh, attention? Uh, what is less uh, that still can get a gain attention but thrive from that attention? Um, these are all questions, again, as a, as a community um, that you are primed uh, to, to deal with. And, and that's, uh, again, what this meeting is, is, is launching. So I'm going to stop there and uh, answer some questions. I've got time for questions. And then, uh, and, and Rhea, who uh, is the, so I showed you that big map of the 20 states to start with and, and the climate change response framework. So we have coordinators who are basically um, attached to those different colored areas that I showed you. So Maria is one of those, and she, and her area is right here in uh, New England. Uh, so she is a resource for you. Uh, her job is specifically to help you all think about climate change and, and, uh, and meet your goals uh, uh, in spite of climate change. And you think about how to do that. Um, so uh, she thinks and has been studying this area and it's probably even more than me, so, uh, so she might answer some of these questions when I crash in there. So, yes. Um, about the range shifts, the question is, uh, the big question I was having at the time. Yeah. And they, do they have time to switch their range? I mean, you say the black oak is going to take over. I mean, does it have, some of these people do they have time to be able to change the range? Most no, they don't. Um, uh, the um, the climate is is uh, uh, the shifts in the range. If you were to measure them year by year, which would be a little silly, but you could do it just as a as a as a, as a game. Um, it would be happening much more slowly for range shift and the climate shift in the same time scale. Um, and uh, so, in all likelihood, uh, they can't on their own as quickly. Um, so uh, that doesn't mean, though, that um, um, that there won't be some of those same species existing in these forests that you can't foster and help live. And also doesn't mean you can't plant them if you want them there. But also the critical part is, again, it doesn't mean that the, the ones, that, the species that we love and know that live here are just going to die right after that and need to be replaced. So just It'll take plants time to move, and for us to be a part of that. But we, I think, we also have time uh, to to cope with all of that and think about it and help and, and help foster uh, the kinds of systems that we value, um, including the ones that are here now. So it's not it's not like that. Now related to that, invasive species, I presume, shift easier and quicker. Yeah, don't they? So yeah, that's the that's the issue with those is that um, they are. Uh, um, 
Well, we call them weeds for a reason, and they have uh, biological strategies where they thrive on exactly the sorts of things that we're going to see more often in terms of, of, of floods and disturbance and blowdown and uh, ice storms causing gaps. Uh, uh, and of course, people spread them very easily. Um, and so uh, that becomes one of those issues that, that I think as a community uh, that you all can talk about, um, about what you have in terms of invasives now, how that uh, threatens uh, what you value that is also there now that you want to maintain, and then um, how that may change given climate uh, change, and then how you might prioritize dealing with so, you know, it's, it, I think that in, in a lot of places, especially when you have more people, like this one, it's one of the biggest issues to think about. Um, certainly, when you're thinking about climate change. Uh, thank you. I mean, this is a very persuasive presentation, and thank you for that. Um, one thing that arises here is food security. And I mean, it may not be within your brief, but to what extent has work been done on the impact on food security? So uh, for those of you who might not have heard, so the question was, what, uh, to what extent is work being done on the issue of food security? Uh, I think that um, around the world, a lot of work is being done, um, especially in areas that don't have the infrastructure uh, that we have in the United States. In the United States, uh, I would say that um, in some federal and state agencies, uh, there has been work done scientifically. Um, until very recently, I would say that there has not been a major initiative uh, to think uh, very concretely with about food security and then talk with the people who actually grow food. Um, and literally, just in the past year, there is an initiative uh, launched uh, called the USDA uh, Regional Climate Hub uh, and, and Network. It has a much, much longer name, actually. Adaptation, mitigation, risk, um, climate. But it's, I don't know. I, 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 it, I'm a part of it. I'm one of the I can't remember. But the... Uh, but one of the central focus um, areas of that, of that hub is to bring all the various UST agencies, Farm Service Bureau, um, well, a, a lot of the bureaus that deal specifically with farmers and that don't deal with climate change very much. It's, it's stunning how little they do. And retool them and get them to work together and, um, and then get them to, in fact, supply information on climate to farmers so that farmers can make uh, decisions uh, that are um, climate informed. And um, so that's it's a big initiative just started, um, and I've, for the first time I've talked with more Aggies in the last year than I have in my entire life, and uh, and I'm also a scientist uh, originally by training. So um, and, and it's it's fun to see them um, really grapple this issue and start to run with it, and, and I think that uh, in fact will be pretty well. You're much further along the the, the knowledge curve than they are. They just started. I feel like we are, I mean, not to, you know, ring our own bell or anything, um, but, but we are actually uh, working with a lot of the Aggies and showing them what we've done in our own methods of uh, working with um, resource professionals and uh, what has been effective and why. And, uh, and we're finding ways to translate that same uh, kind of those same kinds of approaches into uh, farming, both small scale and large scale industrial farming. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if this is the right point in the uh, program to ask this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, because I'm not sure exactly how to answer it. I was wondering if like, um, people with your uh, background and concerns how they would answer it. That is, you know, what is resilience exactly in the landscape? I mean, I can think of a number of different things it could be, right? Maybe it's biodiversity maintaining a sufficient degree of biodiversity. Maybe it's a landscape that has enough pockets, so to speak, to protect uh, existing species. Maybe it, I, I'm not sure. So I mean, I was wondering what the thinking is, what's um, the direction of thinking is on how to think about or define resilience. Uh, that is a wonderful question. Uh, for those of you who might not have heard it, uh, the question was, uh, what is resilience, um, and how do you think about it across the landscape? How do you think about it in terms of biodiversity? Um, how do you approach it in terms of climate change? In fact, that is a fundamental part of what we're going to be talking about a little later. Um, Maria is going to hit that one um, head on. I'll say that resilience, thinking about it across a landscape, is going to be a little different than thinking about it in uh, 100 acres or even 1,000 acres. And, um, and you might think about 
multiple different types of ecosystems across the landscape and the resilience of the landscape with that. Whereas in a parcel, you might be thinking about the resilience of that little forest stand or that little combination of, um, of family farm uh, with stream going through it and buffer around the stream and its ability to withstand some exchanges. So fundamentally, we work with uh, a 45-year-old uh, ecological definition of resilience that it can basically take a hit uh, in uh, disturbance and come back. That's been adapted to climate change and that it can also um, withstand uh, these temperature uh, and precipitation changes and essentially maintain its essential character. And so again, what you, how you apply those definitions at a landscape can be different than at a place, a smaller place. Um, and, uh, but there, and there's bigger ways to think about that too. And Marie, will, will, she'll come back to this, right? Well, I, I'm not going to come back to okay. it as much because we're not going to hit it as head on. But I think what you said is, is right. And, and the, the, the example I always use, maybe Chris doesn't like it because he doesn't use it, is I think about like resilience as a rubber band. You know, you stretch it and it bounces back and it's still a rubber band. And, and so you're kind of looking for these places. There's different ways, like you said, to think about it. But I mean, if you're talking about the resilience of a place and it's, it's, you're really talking about its ability to withstand changes and disruptions and stretch, but then return more or less back to that same condition with that same character and the same values and functions and, and things that you'd associate it with. It has the same character. It hasn't changed in, in some fundamental way. Um, and, and so there's kind of the natural, and we talked about this, there's the kind of natural resilience that a place might have, and that's kind of what those maps are getting at in the English muffin. Um, you know, there's, there's that part of it, but then there's also the stewardship piece, which is you can also do activities to help enhance or take advantage of that resilience. So it, it can be a little, it's a, it's a really great question because it's such a word and we struggle with it as professionals because it can mean so many things. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of today, we're really focusing on kind of thinking about the resilience and that kind of natural capacity of a place to buffer change. Um, but, but that can also be enhanced through actions. And I'd like to add too, because you uh, heard um, Bill talk about Mark Anderson's work about biodiversity and uh, more better than average uh, resilience in certain parts of the landscape. And, um, and so, you know, one thing to think about is the concept of resilience in terms of function of a place and the concept of resilience in terms of the assemblage of plants and animals in a place. And so, and the, that assemblage, you might think about the character of the identity that we all we all see when we walk through a given a forest or grassland or, or whatever. Um, but uh, you might think that, uh, and then perhaps it's, uh, it's in one of those hot spots of biodiversity, and there's lots of different plants there. Um, but uh, and, and so there might be a resilience of function where, through time with climate change, uh, that system will remain a forest and still very diverse. But if you were to come back in 100 years, it would be wonderful. If you were coming back in 100 years and walk through there, you were like, wow, this is not the same forest. This is, this is not what I walked through when I was a kid. This is something completely different. This is terrible. Or this is beautiful. Either way, now it's, so it's got this resilience and function in that case. It's still a forest that's diverse. But it did not have resilience in this forest because perhaps all those species in that forest were northern species. And perhaps um, their arrangement was gone. They died off. And so different people use that in different ways, and it's always very good to be explicit about what you mean uh, when you're talking about resilience. Because if you're talking about function, and they're thinking the the forest they knew as a child, um, you know they might get a little upset when you talk about just replacing your pine. That's how most people that I talk to do. Yes. Yes. I don't think about it um, in terms of ecosystem function. I agree. Uh, I would say that you have um, some cavi ecologists. Uh, and, and, and resource professionals who might think of function. A lot of them still just think of assemblage. But I would say most of the general public, if, you know, like 99%, think of it in terms of uh, identity and character. So that's something to be very aware of when we're talking about this. Yes. And I'm just thinking that, um, you know, when we, when we talk about resiliency, and I guess we'll get more in depth with it, but we talk about plants, animals, and insects that are all already in integrated with each other. And, you know, coupled with the changing climate, their ability to change each one of those things, even 
they're independent on each other, aren't going to be able to, I'm sure, aren't going to be able to change at the same rate. Yes. So are we talking about um, a new landscape that's been adapted by these various things that can survive in, in, in kind of a new form and maybe a new combination? Is that, is that what we're talking about? Um, that is an excellent question, and it's a deep question. Um, and so uh, I, I think I'll turn that right back around to you guys because that's one of the questions for you. So the, the basic, the basic, very simply put concept there is that uh, species move and species change, ecosystems don't. So it's not that the ecosystems move around, it's the individual species in it are, whether they're plant, animal, or insect. And, um, and so as that happens, you can imagine that the mixtures of all that are going to create something completely new, maybe something we've never seen before. And so uh, the question becomes, um, to the extent that there is climate pressure to change some things faster and differently than others, and that system begins to respond in some way to the pressure, uh, what part are we going to play in that? You know, and this is something that we'll talk about a little later, but specifically. You know, and that depends really on our values and how much risk that we're willing to uh, carry. Because the harder the pressure is, the faster, the more that system wants to move. The more we want it to stay the same, uh, the more risk we can carry uh, because it may have a catastrophic failure while we're trying to keep it just the same. And in the meantime, we're going to have to invest more in keeping it just the same. So if there's a lot of pressure and the system is beginning to change quickly uh, and we want to adapt to that, um, and our values allow us to do that, or even encourage us to, um, you know, then it becomes more a question of how do we roll with it? How do we help soften the blow, soften the landing, um, maintain function in the system, uh, even though its uh, assemblage is vulnerable, maintain biodiversity, even as the character changes. You know, that's another view of, of how to deal with this. And, um, but the decision is going to be with land bowl. We still have time if anyone has any. Well, maybe this is for the next session in January. I'm not sure. Uh, the people that we're going to be speaking to mostly live in houses, um, not in forest. No. And so it's important to me, and I, I do understand this because I've studied it a little bit, the climate change aspect. It's important to me to, to find that link between speaking to people about climate change and helping them to understand that it has to do with the climate system and how that will affect this guy who lives in his house or even, and I know we're not here to protect suburbs and cities, that's not what we're talking about, but really ultimately it is. By protecting the environment and by limiting the aspects of climate change, we're protecting our infrastructure, right? That's you know, what happened to, I mean, if, if there weren't any people, Hurricane Sandy wouldn't matter. If there were no buildings or bridges, bridges and roads. So, so I, I'm interested in that in that link. So that when we go out to talk to people about it, um, we have that that connection. I don't know what you're saying, but that, that's that's what I'm talking about. And I don't know. Maybe that's not for today. Maybe that's for next time. I think, and I'll, I'll defer to Bill as well, but I mean, I think that that's kind of not only today, it is carrying forward, but I think, you know, part of it is, and this is what this discussion's really interested is, and, and we will spend more time kind of having you grapple with it and what it means to you and your areas because you're going to be the translators. And so we can, we'll have this, you know, we'll, through the day to day, we'll have this conversation about that. And so, you know, um, I kind of think about it as, you know, like there's the, there's the, scientists i'm um, not chris but the scientists who like can't talk to the can't talk to the like anyone else who's not a scientist about you know because they don't make sense and there's scientists like chris who can talk to talk to um everybody and then you know my position is to kind of go in between and then you guys are another link in that chain and so you know we're kind of doing this you know passing the torch from one to the other so that way we can think about how to how to communicate that so um especially i think during the activities we'll be um, uh, we'll be doing a lot of things to kind of help think about what it means in these particular places because those are the those are the hooks is the closer we get this down to those particular focal areas and the places um, where people are living 
that's going to be how we how we draw them in for sure. Yeah, your question I feel like uh, in, in a large way sums up the rest of the day. Um, <coughs> what you're asking is for a large part um, what we're hoping that we can develop by focal area, by a broader edge to edge, um, and it's something that I think that you all be grappling with as you move forward, and we'll be happy to be a part of that to the extent you would like us to. But um, very, very much what uh, Maria said, you guys are that that crucial link with the people who live in the houses, maybe on a quarter acre, maybe on an acre, uh, maybe on 10. And, and the first critical step is to know them, to listen to them, because uh, because this isn't about climate change. It's first about people. It's first about what people care about. Um, and then it's about thinking about conservation and how we do that. Yes. At the beginning, you mentioned uh, adaptation demonstrations as part of your climate change response framework. Can you give examples of any of those demonstrations? And if there are some, are there any ideas on how much that would be to this uh, each two weeks grant for this? Yeah, I think Maria can jump. Yeah. yeah, well, we didn't talk much about those, and we can. So, yeah, these adaptation demonstrations are places where we we show what adaptation looks like on the ground, and so certainly as you guys are, are figuring this out and have things, um, we would definitely be interested in, in um, developing them with you. Um, I Let's see, we have a couple, um, we've only been working in New England for about a year, and so especially in southern New England, they're um, still a little sparse, but um, I am working with Providence Water and a couple of the water supply um, systems in Massachusetts, and so that would be easy, you know, potentially I could see doing something similar in, um, in Connecticut in terms of, um, and then also um, Patricia Butler, my counterpart, kind of, or in New York, you know, thinking about kind of how do we do these conservation and implement some of these activities in water supply areas. Those have been ones where people are definitely interested. Um, I've been working with folks at um, Yale Forest um, and so actually there, that relates to the food security question, they actually wanted to do a demonstration for us more about um, kind of agroforestry and in integrated kind of um, forest food systems and also putting a climate change kind of filter on that in terms of thinking about that. And so they actually have a, um, I think it's a, like an old agricultural field that they're reforesting, but they're also doing it with a lot of, you know, um, nut trees and, and edible foods in mind. Um, also working with folks at UConn, and I think we'll do, be doing a training um, with them, and then that will get a lot of the forest management community. Because what we typically do is we often work with, with the land managers and the natural resource organizations um, to help kind of train up the professionals so that way when, when you guys are looking for a professional, there's somebody who's informed that you can work with. Um, so that's often how it works. and so. We have a couple going, they're pretty early in, um, in southern New England, but that would be the sort of thing we'd be really interested in developing, developing more of because if we implement these, um, I think that that's been a little, maybe a little sprawly, I'd have enough coffee, but I think that that's been, you know, that really has been where we've launched the most um, engagement is when we're able to kind of just show people what it looks like and take, in this case, you know, a lot of times it's um, natural resource professionals or landowners sometimes but um, out in the woods and they can kind of see it and have the person who's the manager for that particular property or the landowner talk about why it's important to them. That really catapults the discussion a lot further because it's tangible and people can feel it and, and it doesn't look scary because it's just being out um, and it's, it's not nearly as intimidating. So that's been really good. So, so the bottom line with those is, uh, is going to somebody so the, the demonstration isn't just the place. It's not just a trail with some signs on it. It's the demonstration is the entire process. And um, the process starts with the person and the place uh, that they care about and value and are stewarding and, um, and what their goals are uh, for that place. And then it's about bringing uh, uh, the, the climate information to the table and saying, here are the regional trends, here are the regional pressures. You know this place. Let's talk about how you think these pressures, these changes are going to play out uh, in this place that you care about, that you know, given your knowledge of its history, of what's there now, of um, its landforms, uh, of its water sources, uh, of how you intend to continue uh, working with it. Uh, now let's talk about, given all that, whether you still think you can meet the conservation goals that you have and, um, and the objectives to get there. And, uh, and, and maybe there are tweaks uh, that you can do in 
order to still meet them given the climate pressures. And what are those tweaks? Those tweaks essentially are adaptation. Um, and so the, uh, the, the goal is to still um, reach your, your fundamental conservation objectives, uh, but you might just do it a little differently. And that might mean that uh, where you have uh, some of these species in some parts of the, of the, the landscape that are uh, projected to lose suitable habitat, um, you think, well, where are they likely to be most vulnerable in the landscape? And, and maybe it is slowly over time begin to foster other species there that are projected to do better. But you might still love that species and you find some parts of your land where, uh, again, they're in a cold pocket. For, for example, and you do everything you can to keep them there in that case. And so uh, that's an example of um, that escape on the landscape. And perhaps you even plant them there, um, or they're not there now, but you think they will do well. And so, you know, that's the kind of demonstration. And then, and then telling the story, ultimately, then that becomes the demonstration. And, uh, and so we have on our website, forestadaptation.org, we have a demonstrations uh, section of the map, and we've got little dots on the map showing where uh, we have different um, stories. And then you click on a story, we try to keep it short and digestible, but it goes through that same basic process. What are you trying, you know, where are you? What are you trying to do? Um, how are you trying to do it? How do you think climate's gonna affect that? What are you doing about it um, to, to overcome those effects uh, or, or cope with them and so on, work with them? And we try to get a lot of different stories from lots of different perspectives so that we can. So, and then that's something that as you all uh, cope with this, um, we would love to have your stories. Um, and of course, none of this precludes uh, these stories being told in lots of different places and lots of different ways. We would help 